Thank you. Cool. I'm super excited. My name's Rachel Richards. I'm a lot of things. I'm a former financial advisor. I am the best-selling author of two books on finance. So Money Honey has almost 1,300 reviews and Passive Income Aggressive Retirement is my other book. Uh, that's where I got the nickname Money Honey Rachel. So it just kind of stuck whether I liked it or not. I do like it. It's kind of fun. Um, I am a real estate investor and by the age of 26, I owned almost 40 rental units. In 2019, at the age of 27, I quit my job and retired. And I'm now living off over $20,000 per month in passive income. Without further ado, I want to show you what it took to go from zero to $10,000 a month in passive profits from investing in real estate. So are you ready? Okay, let's do it. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm gonna show why I think real estate investing is elite, why I think it's the best avenue to achieve financial independence. I'm gonna share the five strategies that helped me get to $10,000 a month. I'll show you how I got started and how I came up with the money. So first, why is real estate investing elite? There are so many financial benefits. A lot of people think it's just about the passive income, but there's a lot more to it. So first you have E, which is for equity buildup. So you come up with a down payment and then your tenants pay the rent and the rental income covers the mortgage for you. So after 30 years, you own a property free and clear, having only paid the down payment on the property. So that's the equity buildup that you get. Then you have leverage. You can, if you have $100,000, I'll put it this way, you could buy one $100,000 property with cash. Or you could take that same 100 grand and buy five $100,000 properties by putting down five $20,000 down payments. Because by using leverage, you can use other people's money, OPM, take out mortgages and get many more properties than you would be able to otherwise. So that's the benefit of leverage. Then you have income. This is the passive income that everyone talks about, the cash flow. So your rental income minus your mortgage payment and all the other expenses leaves you with a monthly profit, a cash flow. That's my favorite part of it. Then you have the tax benefits like depreciation. Then you have E, which is for expected depreciation. I put expected because you can never account, account on appreciation because it's not always a certain thing. It's never certain that it's going to happen as we all saw in 2008, but when it happens, it's a really nice bonus. So appreciation is when the value of the property also goes up over time. Um, the difference with equity buildup and appreciation is when you buy a $200,000 property and you put a $40,000 down payment, over 30 years, you will have the equity buildup of 160 grand that comes from paying down the mortgage. So you're earning 160 grand in equity buildup. Now over that same time period, if the $200,000 property increases in value to $300,000, that's 100K in appreciation that you're also getting. So that's the difference in equity and appreciation. So these are all the benefits. This is why I think real estate investing is elite. Um, I'm gonna show you my real estate journey and the numbers. This is a kind of an overview. Um, and feel free to take a picture because I'm not gonna leave this up super long. I feel like we started getting intentional as investors in 2017 when we purchased our first duplex. Um, and again, you can screenshot this. I'm gonna move on pretty quickly. I just thought the numbers might be helpful and interesting. And we put 20 to 25% down on all of our properties purchased in 2017 and after. So let's get into the five strategies. Strategy number one, is that I saved 50% of my income. Now here's a few reality checks I like to get out of the way because people make a lot of assumptions about me when they hear about my story. Um, I'm not a trust fund baby, okay? I'm not a trust fund baby. And I never made six figures. I never made six figures from a job or a career. I started off making $36,000 my first year after graduating from college. Then I made $32,000. Then I made $42,000. So by no means was I raking it in. I started from nothing. I actually graduated from college in 2013 with $26 to my name. So if I can go from that to this in just a few years, and I believe this 100%, that anyone at any age on any income can absolutely achieve financial independence through real estate investing. So what allowed me to save 50% of my income? First of all, I did not have student loan debt. So even though I wasn't making a lot of money, I didn't have these big student loan payments that I had to worry about, which allowed me to save a lot more. So that was a big advantage. Um, also, when I first graduated, I was renting a room 
from somebody I met off Craigslist. I verified that they were not a serial killer, so it ended up working out. Um, but I rented a room for like $450 a month. My budget back then was $1,500 a month, and I still have screenshots from how that broke down and what I did, but I was living very, very frugally, and it was a lot of sacrifice in those early years. Because I was saving so much, I was able to max out my Roth IRA and save $10,000 in my savings account a couple, by a couple years after graduating from college. So I started all of this with $10,000 in savings by 2017, and I was 24 years old at the time. Okay, strategy number two is that I invested in an affordable cash flowing market. Who can guess this city that doesn't know me? <laughs> Who said it? Louisville. Yeah, Louisville, Kentucky. Good job, bourbon and horses. Um, <clears throat> so that's where I invested. I was lucky to live there at the time. And if you're wondering what city to invest in, I'm gonna share with you some factors that I look for. So number one, I look for a landlord-friendly city. I look for places that don't have rent control, that don't restrict whether you're able to evict your tenants. You need to make sure you have rights as a landlord. I looked for places that are affordable. So, and on that note, if who, is there anybody live in California? Okay, some people, yeah. I coach and I teach a lot of people that live in California and I always encourage them, don't be afraid to invest out of state. I used to be really scared to have rentals that were not in the state that I live in. But once I moved away from Kentucky to Colorado, I realized how easy it was to manage my properties from far away. It's very, very doable. And there's a lot of other people in this room that do the same thing that you can talk to about that. So don't be afraid to invest out of state and invest in a different city that's much more affordable so they don't have to come up with a hundred grand down payment. Uh, make sure your market is cash flowing. And normally if it's a more affordable market, it'll be a cash flowing market as well. I also like to look for cities that I'm familiar with. So even if I don't live there, maybe I lived there in the past, maybe I have family and friends there. That way I can ask them about the different zip codes and areas. Property taxes. Property taxes that are on the low to average range, which I find to be about 1% or less if the state has property taxes that are in that range. Okay, strategy number three. What I have found in this market in 2022 that is that finding a good deal on the MLS is nearly impossible. It is so competitive, it is so saturated. The MLS is the multiple listing service, that's what realtors have access to. And when anyone is looking for a house, whether it's a primary homeowner or an investor, typically what they do is they look on the MLS or on Zillow. The problem is everyone's doing that. It's easy to do. You literally don't have to get off the couch, off your butt to look at properties that way. Everyone's doing it. If you wanna find good deals in this market, you have to be creative. You have to be willing to do what others are not to find a deal that's giving, gonna give you a cash on cash ROI of 12%. And this is what I'm passionate about. This is what I specialize in is finding off market deals. So these are some of the strategies that I've personally done. Some of the strategies that I know very well Finding off-market deals is essential, being really creative with how you're able to find properties. Okay, delayed gratification. I love this tweet, because it's very true for me. I've driven Honda Civics for a long time, uh, used cars. I like being poor, because anytime I'm in a car that was made after 2015, I feel like I'm in a spaceship. <laughs> so <laughs> my rental car, which is this Kia Sportage, feels very, very luxury to me right now. Um, we were very good at delaying gratification throughout this process. So for example, by the time we closed on this duplex, which was cash flowing $500 a month in profit right off the bat, so it was a great deal, we could have been like, you know what, let's live it up. We have worked so hard, we finally made it, we can upgrade our lifestyle, we can finally buy that new car that feels like a spaceship, we don't have to keep sacrificing anymore. But instead of doing that, we decided not to give into lifestyle creep, and we decided to continue to delay gratification and take that $500 a month and save it to invest into the down payment for the next rental property. I wanna show you an example, since I was talking about our duplex, I wanna show you the numbers on this property before I get into strategy number five. So this was our first duplex. This was a duplex in Louisville, Kentucky, and we purchased this for $100,000. Now I know those of you living in California are like, I can't even buy a parking spot for $100,000. <laughs> so this was 100 grand. We purchased this in 2017. We had to come up with a 20K down payment. So my ex-husband and I each had $10,000 in our savings that we pooled together to get to the 20K down payment. 
this was immediately cash flowing $500 per month, and that's after all expenses. So that's after the mortgage, insurance, taxes, vacancy, maintenance and repair, CapEx, HOA, it wasn't an HOA, but all of the other expenses. So that's pure profit, which gave us a 25% cash on cash ROI. I knew at the time this was gonna be the best deal I ever did, and it, it was, and it is to this day. So this was crazy. And over the next four or five years, it just got better from here. So even if your first deal when you buy it doesn't look that good, when you look out over the next five years or the next 10 years, that's when things get really, really awesome. So I wanna show you what this looks like now. It's about five years later now, but $100,000 purchase price, it's now worth 175K. So it's appreciated $75,000. Now my net worth is 75 grand higher. It now cash flows $800 per month that's $400 per month per door, which is really unheard of. So that's given us $30,000 just from the cash flow in profit over the last four years. That's a 32% cash, I'm a numbers person, I'm sorry, this is so much. That's a 32% cash on cash ROI just from the cash flow profits over the last four years. And these numbers don't even include the equity buildup and the tax benefits. And this is just from one property. We have five other buildings. So this can really change your life. Just one rental property can really change your life. And that's why I think this is so exciting. Okay, strategy number five is that I had my real estate license. This for me was really the key in why I was able to scale my portfolio quickly. So I had my real estate license not for my own purposes of having clients that I helped sell or buy houses. It was just for my own purposes as an investor. Because I had my real estate license, I was able to represent myself as, a, as the buyer's agent on every deal that we did. So I would, we would deplete our savings when we bought the house, which was a little risky, but I knew that at the closing, I would get a commission check back because I was one of the realtors on the deal. Sometimes the commission would be for a few thousand dollars. Sometimes it would be for $10,000 or more. And we were trying to save up money quickly for the down payment. So this commission of 10 grand, 11 grand, 12 grand, would be a huge chunk of money that we could then put towards the down payment on the next property. So this was really essential for us. It was not just a money advantage, but it was a time advantage because I had access to the MLS. I could see properties as they were listed. And back then I was actually able to find a, a deal on the MLS because I was the first one down at the property because I was a realtor and I was able to make a verbal offer on the phone 30 minutes after it was listed. So having my real estate license was a huge benefit. Okay. If you don't have 20K or 10K or whatever amount of money starting out, um, money is the biggest obstacle to scaling quickly, I have found. And if I didn't have a partner or a spouse to combine finances with or to combine W-2 income with to get lending, these are some of the methods I would have used. I waited for a while to start investing in real estate because I thought you had to have a 20% down payment or a 25% down payment. Do any of you think that? Like you have to have a... 20% down payment to invest. Okay, I was operating under that assumption and I waited many years to start. I started when I was 24, which is by no means late in the game, that's still very early. But if I knew then what I know now, I could have gotten started when I was 18 years old. So I wanna share some of these methods with you. And by the way, does anyone here, and this is very common, but does anyone here feel like money is an obstacle to getting started investing in real estate? Okay. That's what I used to think. So under that assumption, these are some methods that you can utilize to start investing in real estate if you don't have any money or if you have very little money. So number one is wholesaling. Wholesaling is when you go out and you find a deal on a rental property and you make an offer and you get something called an assignable contract. And then you take that contract and you sell it to another investor who does have money and who wants to buy that deal. I have seen wholesalers get paid, and they get paid a finder's fee for this. They get paid a fee for finding these deals. I have seen them get paid 10 grand, 15 grand, 25 grand per deal because they're doing the hard work. Finding a good deal is the hardest part. And trust me, investors with money will pay you to do this for them. So this is a great way to start out. You don't need any money to do this. It'll only take a couple of these, and then you'll have enough money to, to do this on your own. And you're going to learn a lot as you go. Another method is house hacking. Have you all heard of house hacking before? Okay, so the a problem with buying an investment property is that you need a 20, 25% down payment. But if you house hack, that's when you buy it as a primary residence. 
when you buy it as a primary residence and you live in the property, you don't have to put that much money down. You can put 0% down with a VA loan, and that's how I got my first two single family houses. You can put 3.5% down with an FH loan, or you can put 5, 10% down with a conventional loan. So you can house hack, live in the house for a year and then rent it out. You can buy a multifamily, like a duplex or a triplex, live in one unit and then rent out the other units. So that's house hacking. Then there's the Burr method, which was made popular by David Green from Bigger Pockets. And I always get this messed up, but I think it's buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat. Did I get that right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat. So this is a method where you can buy a property that needs some work. You put, do some renovations, and by doing that, you raise the value of the property. You're forcing it to appreciate. Now you have this property that's worth more and that has equity in it. You can do a refinance, a cash out refinance to pull the equity out of the property and use that equity as the down payment on your next property. So when you do this, it's kind of a way to recycle the same down payment money over and over again. And that way you don't have to keep coming up with 25% down payment over one after the other. So that's the Burr method. A, a few more ways to invest without having any money is finding a silent partner. So if you don't have any money, but you're going out and finding good deals, find a silent partner. I've been a silent partner on a deal. I just got a property in Denver this year where I was a silent partner. They didn't have any money, we funded the deal. It was a great partnership. Um, you can ask for seller financing. So you find the deal, if the owner is in a position to carry the mortgage and to do seller financing, you can negotiate that for them. You can make it a win-win and maybe negotiate a smaller down payment. And then again, just be willing to invest out of state because you can save a lot of money that way. Okay, this sounds, I make this, when I talk, like it sounds like this was easy, like, oh, zero to 38 doors in three years, $10,000 a month. And I don't mean to glamorize it, this is not easy. <laughs> This was really, really hard, and I made a lot of mistakes. I cried. I, there was a lot of times I wanted to quit and give up, and I made mistakes that probably a lot of you in here are going to think are so silly, and they're embarrassing to share, but it would not be the full story if I didn't tell you some of the mistakes. And they're embarrassing, but I share them in the hopes that you all will learn from them, because what's the point of me making a mistake if somebody else doesn't learn from it as well? So I want to share some of the top mistakes, just two of the top mistakes that I made, and I can share a ton more. I can talk for days about it. Um, there's also an acronym that I love. It's FAIL, and this is kind of a way to shift your mindset about mistakes. It's not a failure when you make a mistake. FAIL stands for first attempt in learning. So trying something and it not working out is better than not trying at all. It's just your first attempt in learning, and when you make a mistake, you're going to be a better and stronger investor because of it and they're unavoidable no matter how much you prepare. So mistakes are a good thing. One of the, aw the awesomest mistakes that I ever made was hiring a property manager. So I can be too frugal. Can anyone relate? Can I, like with being too cheap? Okay, um, this was the overall mistake. I still struggle with this, by the way. The mistake is that instead of hiring a reputable property management company, we hired employees or people that have been working with us that have been doing things like maintenance, um, lawn care, stuff like that. It was a husband and wife couple. They were amazing, always went above and beyond. We were like, well, let's make them employees of our company, make them property managers because they wanted to. We can save some money, right? And we can be more hands-on without their, without, with how they are managing the property. So that's what they did. We thought this would be a win-win. It was a win-lose and we lost. So it started off great, but at about six months in, my ex-husband went to the properties to collect the rent one Saturday from the on-site lockboxes, and he realized there was a lot of rent money missing. And it wasn't just the normal tenant or two paying late, it was a lot of money. So come to find out, our property managers stole $6,000 in rental income from us that weekend, and we found out they'd been squatting in vacant rooms and units on our properties for almost a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was fun, 10 out of 10 recommend. Not really. Um, <laughs> the moral of the story is don't be cheap. This is not the place to cut corners. You need to hire professionals as you're scaling your rental property business. And that goes not just for property managers, but that goes for your CPA, your attorney, the contractors. Rarely is it a good idea to go with the cheapest option. Okay, I'm telling myself this as well. I have to learn this lesson. Um, if we had hired a licensed insured property management company and one of their employees had stolen that money from us, 
they would have been liable for the damages, not us. So that was a really big mistake that we learned. So please learn that lesson from my, so that my $6,000 is not wasted. Okay, uh, another quick mistake is when I got robbed. This one's fun. Uh, we had just closed on a really big duplex that we were renovating, so it was empty. And we had the security system that we had ordered. We hadn't put it up yet, though. So it was just a couple days after we closed. The contractors had started work. And one night, the property got broken into. So the thing was, the day before, we had all these appliances delivered. It was $15,000 worth of brand new appliances. So my contractor called me the next morning. He's like, Rachel, I have bad news. The property got broken into and robbed. And I'm like, Ben, are the appliances still there? And he's like, yes. And I'm like, oh my god. I got so lucky. And basically what happened, it was probably just some teenagers that broke in and took what they could carry and just vandalized the place. I was so, so lucky. But I spent the whole day securing the property because now that they knew all these brand new appliances were there, I had to go secure the property. So I spent all day living out that nightmare. Um, so the lesson is, you need to secure your physical assets. When we talk about protecting our rental property business, we often think about LLCs. We often think about umbrella policies, but we don't often think about how do you protect your physical property right after you close? And smarter, wiser, older investors know that the first thing they do after they close is they put up a security system, they change the locks, they put up fake security cameras, they put up fake security stickers, they close the blinds every night, they alternate turning on lights in different rooms at night so it looks like somebody's living there. Those are the things investors do. I didn't know to do that when I started out, but now you do. Um, because people target, robbers, people that want to do this, they will target properties that are being renovated for the properties that they want to break into because they know no one's living there. And that's what they do. So that was another mistake that I made. Super fun. Okay. So some takeaways, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. But what I want you to take away from what I have shared today, I know I gave you a lot of information. Um, I want you to believe that you need less money than you think to get started. You need less money than you think to get started. This money is not an obstacle. It is rarely an obstacle. It's just a limiting belief. And it's what I used to think, and it's what a lot of people think. The hardest part, actually, about investing in real estate is finding a good deal. So if you feel stuck, you really need to focus on finding a good deal. And when you do that, the money will come. I promise you. Because there's going to be another investor out there. And when they see that you've found a good deal, and it really is a good deal, they're going to be willing to partner up with you. I promise you. So don't worry about the money. You will figure out how to finance it. You will figure out the money. There's going to be a way. You just have to find a really good deal in this market. So that's what to focus on. Number two, be willing to sacrifice. This is not an easy journey, and you will want to quit many, many times. Be willing to sacrifice whether it's your time, whether it's your comfort, whether it's your energy, whether it's your sleep, whether it's your money. You will have to sacrifice one or all of those things at some point as you're building out your real estate empire. And number three, there's a quote that says knowledge is power. And I disagree with that quote. <laughs> knowledge is only power if you do something with it. And the mistake I made was waiting for so long to take action. No matter how much you know or prepare, you're still going to make mistakes. So at some point, you have to switch from consuming the knowledge to executing on the knowledge. Knowledge is only power when you do something with that knowledge. So just keep that in mind, and I really encourage you to take those first steps. There's this quote by Zig Ziglar that I love. He said, you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. So I'm going to wrap up with that. These are my resources. We'll do some Q&A. But what I want to do for you all is if you want to download my Passive Income Starter Kit, I will give that for free. So you can go to that link to download it. It has all the passive income streams, mistakes to avoid. Um, you can grab a copy of my books on Amazon, but I brought a bunch over there. And if you would like one, then at some point this weekend, you have to come up to me and sing me a song. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You don't have to do that. I don't think there's enough for everyone, but um, they are over there. So help yourself. Those are for you all. And then you can follow me on Instagram at MoneyHoneyRachel. Um, so that's it. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>